Dan, thank you for being here. I'm a great admirer of yours. Uh, you're an amazing columnist, writer. Your book uh, in 2018 was named one of the best books of 2018 by the Chicago Tribune. And uh, it's a, it's, I, I'm so glad that you're with us. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. You're on my wish list of people from the New York Times to have on the read along. And uh, I'm sorry that it's because we're talking about Jim that we have you here. So I hope you'll come back another day when we can talk about your work. Uh, let's, let's start with the story of Jim, uh, a, a, a journalist who I first got to know uh, because of his work at Newsday. And he won a Pulitzer Prize in 95 for his work in 94 and earlier. And then he joined the New York Times. And he passed away this, uh, this week at the age of 63. I, 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 I advanced his age to 65 in the promo card. So I'm sure Jim would be amused by that, that uh, I added two years there in a simple error on a, but a big mistake on that. He would have not been happy. I got to meet him, uh, Dan, when, uh, because he's a fellow alum of Columbia Journalism School. So right. we would run into events and things over the years in New York. The media scene is big, but not that big, as you know. Right. Well, um, I wish he had two more years, actually. I wish the typo were true, uh, and certainly more than that. Um, he was a stellar, stellar journalist, and uh, journalists often say that about one another. But uh, what distinguished Jim was um, first his sense of righteousness and, se and secondly, uh, what a decent, uh, good man he was. And um, if, you were go if you were to go to the New York Times uh, Metropolitan Newsroom today, if we were allowed back in, um, you would hear a series of testimonies from younger reporters uh, including reporters who have only been there a couple of years, and they would speak about how Jim had been supportive of them and had encouraged them and would take note of even the smallest stories that they might have written for the Times. And that's just one little hint of what kind of guy Dwyer was. And he had a lot of impact in his, his reporting and writing made a difference. Uh, and had an impact. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You can see here the headline uh, in the New York Times obit, uh, Jim Dwyer, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, dies at 63, working for New York Newsday, The Daily News and The Times. He covered the human stories of New York in dramatic prose and crusaded against injustice. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, he directed, uh, he often directed his, his great talents and his uh, his really sharp Jesuitical intellect uh, to stories of injustice um, and uh, giving voice to the voiceless and the vulnerable. And uh, those who read the wonderful obituary by Bob McFadden will see that uh, Jim came by it honestly in a way. Um, his uh, parents were both born in Ireland. Uh, they were working class. They raised a family in a small apartment in the Upper East Side, the Upper Upper East Side. And Jim understood um, what it was like to struggle and to, um, to work hard. Um, and so that informed his journalism. You know, his mother was a nurse at Bellevue. His father was a custodian in the school. And I think Jim, uh, it's a great uh, credit among the Irish to say that you never forgot where you came from. And that's, that was Jim. And so if you go and look at, at his work over the course of four decades, um, one common theme is this sense of um, pursuit of justice and also the injustices that have been um, uh, leveled against um, um, working class, uh, people of color, uh, the invisible, you know, the quote unquote invisible among us. And that's really where his uh, truest strength um, uh, lay. So um, there are many, many examples of uh, championing um, uh, people, uh, for example, um, uh, black teenagers who were being racially profiled um, by New Jersey state troopers or writing about the Central Park Five. And in fact, Jim thought often about how he had covered it initially and had the courage and the integrity to say maybe he got some of that wrong in his initial reporting. Um, 
he also championed um, awareness of sepsis because uh, uh, the child of a friend of his had died of sepsis at the age of 12. You know, a little nick on the arm and it developed into something worse. And Jim used his platform to uh, heighten awareness about sepsis. Um, you know, there, there are myriad examples, um, but that's, that's who Jim was, sure. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to just kind of look through the stories here as Neil's sharing this right now. Um, I'm just looking at all, the, the range was also quite stunning. Right, I, you know, some people, uh, some of us listening here may think, oh, Jim Dwyer just came fully formed to the New York Times in about 2001. He had an unbelievable career uh, 20 years, uh, for the 20 years preceding that, um, first at some small newspapers in New Jersey and then coming to the um, Daily News um, and then for New York Newsday, he won a Pulitzer in 1994 with some really wonderful, wonderful columns. So, you know, he had, a, he had an extensive, admirable journalistic track record before he came to the Times. And then he arrived at the Times in, I think, around May or so of 2001. And, you know, as we all know, four months later, 9-11 uh, happened. And it's fitting in retrospect uh, for me, um, I can tell you how I met him and got to know him. But on 9-11, I was, uh, you know, I live in New Jersey and I had to rush to get into the city when everyone else is rushing out. And I somehow made it down to Weehawken and got on the circle line, uh, which was ferrying people across Manhattan to New Jersey. Uh, and so hundreds of people on the ferry going to Weehawken, and then no one is on the ferry going back. I th when I went, it was me and four or five other people. And when we finally reached the, the, um, the other side, the Manhattan side around 43rd Street, there's a swarm of people trying to get back on the circle, to get on the circle line. And I made my way through that crowd. And literally the first person I saw when I um, touched Manhattan ground was Jim Dwyer. And we just looked at each other, stunned, sort of spoke for a few minutes and then went on our paths uh, to cover what had happened. And Jim, you know, um, his his work on 9-11 is distinguished, and I think a lot of people remember him for that, not only for uh, the book he wrote with Kevin Flynn called 102 Minutes, which really is kind of the, the definitive uh, book about exactly what happened and why, um, but he also wrote these wonderful profiles, including one about a squeegee man who was in an elevator with several other guys, and it was stuck in one of the towers after, after one of the hits, and... Uh, and how the squeegee man and the other people on the elevator used it to carve through um, the wall effectively to get themselves freed and they barely, barely made it. But the way Jim tells it is extraordinary. And I think that that squeegee handle uh, was given to the Smithsonian at one point. Wow, just, uh, I'm just thinking about 9-11 again yeah. on this day. And by the way, I was showing you earlier, if you remember the sky of New York City, I was showing you what that, uh, what that looked like. And um, I, my wife and I use this term 9-11 blue when it's that specific shade of, 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 of blue. And we, we think about, so today it's not 9-11 it's not blue, but it's that same crisp weather. And, um, and he really, that 102, story, 102 minutes, I recommend everyone get the book. If you can't get the book, if the Times is, if it should, the original in-depth story that was in the Times is also worth reading as a great introduction, especially we have so many people who for 9-11, you know, it was 20 years ago. Uh, it was uh, a, a long time ago for them and they may not know everything that happened. So do check that out, just the story or the book itself. And uh, I think we have a picture of the, of the uh, of the squeegee tool that was used, uh, we saw that in the in the obit as well. Tell us how you met Jim Dwyer. Well, you know, like any journalist um, trying to get better, you read the best. And so I um, I would read Jim. I used to work in New England, and uh, I'm I'm from New York, and I would read his stuff. And then when I came to the Times. 
uh, oftentimes he and I were writing about the same issues. And so I finally met him in 2000. Uh, we were in the press pen, if you can imagine this, at uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral for the funeral of uh, Cardinal John O'Connor, which was a huge event uh, in, in Roman Catholicism, but also in New York City. And so we were penned in almost like at a press event and the procession into the, into the cavernous cathedral of, of these clerics uh, from all around the world um, marching, you know, uh, strolling up the aisle uh, seemed to take forever. And, uh, you know, they were almost all men. And, um, and Dwyer turned to me and he said, you know what, they all look like Brian Dennehy, the actor. And I, I remember laughing because it was a, such an apt, uh, uh, an apt moment to, to talk about how all these guys look like, you know, large Irishmen uh, from a uh, central casting, which, and, and the procession lasted, I think, I think it's still going on actually. But. Uh, just reading some of the comments here, Renee Edelman says, hi, Sri, it's an honor to watch you interview Dan Barry of the New York Times. I was a classmate of Jim at Columbia Journalism, class of 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you, Renee, for checking in. And uh, I, I'm sure your classmates would wanna watch this interview later and to hear us talking about Jim. As I mentioned, J I went to J school many years later, but because I was a faculty member there for 20 years, I got to run into Jim and, uh, and just see uh, his influence. Our students loved reading his work. And this Thursday, we found out two hours before my class at Stony Brook that he had died. And our students, you know, um, they're all undergraduates, uh, hadn't read a lot of Jim's work or weren't familiar with him, but I pulled out several of the stories from the Times as well as from the uh, from the obit uh, that the Times, uh, from the Pulitzer Prize uh, citation, the eight or 10 stories. And we read them out loud. I made the students read the read several paragraphs at a time. And we were all moved by the quality of the writing. Uh, mm -hmm. And the students remarked that, how, how did he get to say what he felt? How did, you know, they, because they're taught, as you know, in journalism, especially yeah. in journalism school, that you, know, you wanna uh, just stick to the facts, no opinion, voice from nowhere, you know, all of those things. And I said, well, he earned it, right? He earned the right to be a columnist. You've got to do a lot of reporting and be a great reporter in, in order to be a great columnist. Can you talk about that a little bit in how Jim was able to use that voice? You said, use the platform and make a difference. Sure. You know, so for, for the New York Times cognoscenti, um, the way that the Times tries to signal, at least in the print version, uh, how a piece is um, straight news and how a piece is analysis or, or has voice, you know, or is opinion, is something called ragged right. And it's so, uh, to me, it's so obscure. If I try to explain it to someone who's not, you know, working at the New York Times, they would never notice it. But uh, if you looked at any column by Jim or by me or anyone else in the, in the news columns, the ragged right means that it's not a perfect column of print, uh, of type, it's, it's kind of uh, ragged. Um, Jim, and, you, and you're exactly right, Sri, he, he came by it honestly. So before, before Jim became a columnist, uh, you know, he had worked for years and years. He worked at the Hudson Dispatch, he worked at the Elizabeth Journal, he worked at the Bergen Record, he worked at the Daily News doing tough, you know, hard-nosed journalism. And what happens is editors see someone who has earned a voice, who has has a way of seeing things and and um, and expressing them in in a singular, distinguishable way. And you know that marked Jim's career forever. And so once he was given that privilege, and it really is a privilege to be given a column at a at a newspaper. Um, he, he, I would say he milked it for all it was worth. Um, it didn't mean that he could just riff, okay? So the difference between a, a news column and say a column on the op-ed section or elsewhere is that in the news column, um, it's reported out, okay? So in the finest traditions of people like uh, uh, Jimmy Breslin and, and others, uh, 
as, as someone once said of Breslin, uh, you may have not liked Breslin's writing or his opinion, but he showed up, okay? He showed up. He would go to that tenement in the Bronx. He would go out to uh, Brooklyn and Queens and take the subway and listen. And Dwyer absolutely did that. And so he's reporting the issues out, whether it's some injustice or some curious moment in, 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 the, in, the, in the tragic comedy of New York. And then he would, he, would, he would convey it so that you knew that what he was saying was true. And here's what Jim Dwyer thought about it. And what would happen is you trusted him because he was right. So if he's telling you about a man wrongfully accused and convicted and serving 13 years in prison, um, it didn't come off as uh, him popping off some, you know, liberal propaganda or what have you. It was it was uh, sound. It was as as concrete as the pavement of Manhattan. Thank you. Uh, before I let you go and do two things, I want to show an example of that. Right. I just learned this while you were talking. I was looking at that. So we're going to show that in a second. But the other is talk about his Irish roots, the uh, how you bonded over that, because I'm sure you mentioned it again, not just at that connection you had with uh, at the funeral of, of oh, yeah. the Cardinal. Yeah. You know, um, as the years went by, I think that, um, you know, Carla and others would uh, would attest if you were to go into the cafeteria in the in the New York Times building, both on 43rd Street and then and then where it is now on 8th Avenue, uh, oftentimes you just see Dwyer and me in the corner, and we would just be talking. We were like the we we became you know it was kind of it, it snuck up on us. Suddenly we're the veterans, you know. Suddenly we're the old guys, you know. The younger people saying you wrote something in 1998. I wasn't even born yet. And that's <laughs> a great. That's a great feeling. But Jim and I would sit there and, you know, I would approach him or he would approach me and it would always begin the same way, uh, James, and he would say, Daniel. And then we would sit and talk. A lot of what we talked about, quite frankly, was in fact, Ireland. Um, my mother was from County Galway. His parents were from Galway and Kerry. And, um, you know, it's interesting to think about, as I said earlier, uh, those, those, um, roots, those working class roots, the immigrant roots really kind of informed how he saw the world. And also uh, you mar remarked on his writing. I, I do before I go, I want to point out that um, though he was Irish American, he was not florid in his uh, writing style. If you go back and read the columns, um, he is very, very exacting in his words. Every word matters, okay? He was not one for sentiment. Um, and it struck me, he was a huge fan of the poet, the Irish poet, Seamus Heaney, um, very much so. Um, and uh, going back and reading his stuff over the last few days as I have, you could see that every word mattered, every word mattered. And, uh, and oftentimes he turned prose into poetry. Beautiful, thank you. Let's look at some of the comments and then we will let you go. Uh, sure. There's some beautiful comments. Uh, Zari says, honor to watch this interview. And she says, we have a hands-on manner to engage our audience and participants. Uh, Irish Business New York, enjoy Dan's tweet and photo of him and Jim wearing the same cheap ties bought at Shannon Airport. Let's show that photo again. I know that people would like to see that. Uh, and so this was a coincidence or you guys yeah, planned it? Absolute coincidence. <laughs> and you know, it's one of these ties that when you're at Shannon Airport in the duty-free shop, the ties are wrapped in plastic, you know, so you know they're of fine quality. Um, and so, you know, we were both honoring, you know, our heritage and our parents and Ireland. And uh, I was walking past uh, his desk and we're wearing the same tie and it was a moment. What I can't actually see close enough on the tie. What does it say? Is it, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, and, and it might be a reverse pattern in the ties, but it's, it's basically a kind of a Celtic, uh, a design. That's nice. That's what it is. Nice. Beautiful. Uh, all right. Let's look at some more comments. I see Ashok says, great interview. Uh, Kavita saying, good morning. Miriam says, very interesting. Nicole Nerulius Gupta is watching from New Delhi, fellow Columbia Journalism School grad. And uh, there's so many other comments coming in here. Uh, thank you all for watching. Please share this. And, Jim, uh, and Neil's mom, 
Neil Parekh's mom, Sudha, says Jim Dwyer's life and work is very interesting. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Shri, I, I, I am jumping in. I want to just share one, uh, one comment, if I may, from our friend Lori White um, from uh, Providence. Uh, Dan, uh, Lori is a, a gr close friend of ours, and we've done a lot of work with her. And um, you know, we've been helping with the Jim Tarakani uh, lecture series at um, University of Rhode Island. Lori shared with us that you were actually you led the honor guard uh, at Jim's uh, the, Jim Tarakani's uh, funeral. Um, so she wanted to give a special thank you for that, um, you. and that you were close to to the family. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we got that in there as well. Thank you. What a what a small world, as I said. And Lori Jim Tarakani was Jim Tarakani was the guy in, in Providence or recovering organized crime and other uh, uh, ne'er-do-wells in, in uh, Rhode Island life. Um, he was a great guy. And, uh, and uh, Laurie was a guest on the New York Times Read Along a couple of weeks ago. And we are going to pay tribute to Jim Tarakani. Oh, great. The Tarakani lectures a, uh, a week after the Tuesday after the elections. You know, as uh, I've, I've been, I've taken to saying, if there is a Tuesday after the elections, God knows what's going to happen. But if there is a Tuesday and the internet's working and we're all still here, we will be paying tribute to Jim Tarakani, Laurie White Tarakani's uh, husband, former late husband, and we'll be talking to him, uh, to uh, talking about him during that show. So, uh, thank you very. She much. might be giving you a call, Dan, just as a, a heads up, before. <laughs> Before we leave, uh, tell us a story about this picture right here. Sure. Um, first, notice the um, notice the um, the photo credit that is David Dunlap, um, much much beloved Times journalist for for many years, uh, a dear dear wonderful man. Uh, anytime I had a question about New York architecture um, or the history of New York. Uh, David Dunlap would be the first person I go, and he was very close to Jim as well. Uh, they, David and I sat near each other in the old building, and then later on, David sat near Jim. And so this is, I think, from 2007, and David, of course, chronicled the history of the New York Times from the moment he joined the building, uh, joined, the, joined the newspaper. And uh, everyone else is clearing out their desks, leaving this historic building uh, filled with ghosts and memories, and David lingered uh, to watch as people left. And here, Jim has now just packed up uh, his desk. And I guarantee that in that in that um, wheeled suitcase are little histories of uh, New York, uh, probably some books of poetry, something about something about um, uh, perhaps the Innocence Project, which is about uh, uh, dedicated to the wrongfully accused and convicted. Um, it's a great, great photo. So there's Jim Dwyer, the great Jim Dwyer, leaving the Historic Times building. Um, and um, in a couple of days, he would have his desk in the new building across from the Port Authority on 8th Avenue.